Hi, everyone. I'm McKenna from Murder by the Book in Houston, Texas. Thank you so much for being here tonight. For those of you who watch uh, regularly, you'll notice that I normally actually do have books behind me. I am um, moving homes this weekend, so you have quite the pitiful backdrop I'm subjecting, to, subjecting you to. But um, the good news is that we will um, have two authors in conversation tonight. So I'm just here for introductions and then going to be back on for the comments in a little bit. Uh, before I forget, if you're interested in uh, more information on either of these authors or their books, I'm dropping a link in the comments right now here, uh, the live chat on YouTube and in the comments here on Facebook um, for ordering books, as well as, like I said, more information. Um, we will also have um, pre-orders for signed copies of the William Kent Kruger, in addition to um, obviously the new release tonight by um, John McMahon. Um, we we have we have a lot going on tomorrow night. We'll be back on here with Melissa Larson and Carol Goodman. But next week, um, I just counted, we're going to have over twenty authors um, doing both virtual events with us. Um, we just announced a really cool partnership with Sarah Devello, who was with A Mighty Blaze, and now has started Mystery and Thriller Mavens, her own Facebook group, and she's going to be hosting events um, in uh, conjunction with us, in partnership with us, and streaming on our YouTube and Facebook going forward. So she's got um, Laura Lippman next week and Maureen Johnson, plus all of our um, normal crazy schedule too. So you can check out all of that at murderbooks.com. Um, if you have any questions for either of the authors, don't be shy. You can put them in the comments and I'll be back on in a little bit to uh, moderate those. So there's no such thing as a dumb question. We will get to them when we can. So for the uh, reason we're here tonight, we're here to celebrate celebrate John McMahon's brand new book, the third in the P.T. Marsh series, A Good Kill. Hi, John. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm good. It's so good to see you. I'm sad you're not in store, but, um, you know, we're all doing the best we can here. <laughs> yep. Soon. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and do your formal introduction and then bring on um, Kent. So John McMahon is the author of The Good Detective and One Good Deed. And as I said, um, brand new release this week, A Good Kill. In his role as an ad agency creative director, he's won a gold Clio for his work with Fiat, and he's written a Super Bowl spot for Alfa Romeo. He currently lives in Southern California with his family and two rescue animals. Thank you again for being here. Thank you. We also are here uh, going to be joined by William Kent Kruger, who is our guest interviewer tonight, and I am eternally grateful to all of our guest interviewers. So thank you so much for being here tonight, Kent. My pleasure. My pleasure. Um, I also am going to read your bio really quickly before we get to the conversation. So William Kent Kruger is the New York Times bestselling author of This Tender Land, Ordinary Grace, winner of the Edgar Award for Best Novel, as well as 18 acclaimed books in the Cork O'Connor mystery series, including Desolation Mountain and Sulphur Springs. He lives in the Twin Cities with his family. And I will mention um, again that we will have signed copies of Lightning Strike, which is the new Cork O'Connor book that comes out August 24th. And for those of you who want to actually come in store for an event, he's going to be in store um, in September. I know it's crazy, crazy times. So um, for more details on that, we're still working out logistics. We're still trying to figure out a reservation system and exactly what we're going to do. But stay tuned for more information. We will get to see Kent in store and I'm very much looking forward to it. Okay, I'm going to go away. I'll be back on in about 30 to five, 35 to 40 minutes um, to do questions. You guys have a great talk. Thanks very much, McKenna. Thanks, McKenna. It's good to see you again, John. It's been a while. Absolutely. I think, uh, I think I saw you in Georgia at the Decatur Book Festival. That was the last time. Exactly. And for uh, everyone out there who's watching, I first met uh, John because um, I was given the opportunity to interview you at Boys and Pen, another fine mystery bookstore in Scottsdale, when your first novel, uh, The Good Detective, came out. And I um, have to tell you that that book just knocked my socks off. Um, and I was so pleased when you shot me a request to read your newest with uh, the idea of maybe offering a, a quote for the dust jacket of uh, uh, A Good Kill. And I just want to, I just want to say thanks for including my my quote on the dust jacket. And for those of you out there who haven't had a chance to see it, this is maybe the most important uh, comment I made in my dust jacket quote. There we go. Uh, here's what I said. Uh, let's see. Cross my heart, this thriller may be the best one you'll read all year. And that's a statement I stand firmly behind. This is a terrific novel, John. Thank you so much. Yeah, and it, it was 
this is these things are kind of almost like a trilogy these three books so this was a culmination of a you can read it as a standalone i think kind of like one in three i think you can read the most as standalones but it does sort of wrap up a lot of different things and i, I kind of see it as like a set of three books so it was a lot of fun and got a little bit of extra got some extension with the pandemic starting um to kind of finish it up which is always good to have like another month or two to uh just complete things you know make another run through so it was a lot of fun you mentioned the pandemic before we launch into a discussion of the novel could you talk a little you know the pandemic affected us all in many many ways uh but you were affected um maybe a little more severely than many of us. Could you talk about the effect of the pandemic in terms of your ability to reach readers with your two most recent novels? Yeah, it's it's weird. I was So I was actually at Murder by the Book um, in March, last March, and there were people there, and literally the next day at the next place, there were no people there, and the next day the world shut down. So and I still had more stops and I was headed to the Tucson Book Festival and I was teaching a class there and had like two signings. So this is the way like you really get the word out. So it, it, it was pretty it was pretty rough, actually. I think I was headed to Left Coast Crime. I think I got there thinking it was still because we were in denial in California, like, oh, this won't affect us. It's other people. And then a day later, <laughs> that was canceled and everything. So, yeah, it, it's uh, it, I was in I think the, the New York publishers all knew pretty early like they were throwing the warning signs out like there's something coming but i think a lot of the at least for me a lot of the writers i knew were kind of in denial but yeah shut everything down it was, it was pretty rough it's pretty rough yeah and now you're doing a virtual tour uh this time around uh, and i'm sure you're looking forward you're a great guy in person i'm sure you're looking forward to making that actual connection with real audiences eventually yeah, I mean, there's nothing like, you know, obviously at, at a book reading, the first time out, no one's read the book, right? So so you're trying to make that connection. When you start to go to these other events a year later, some of the book conventions, you actually bump into people who've read your work, and it's really interesting and gratifying. So, I, I you know, I was sort of in the throes of that moment, like coming out with book two, and it does sort of, it, it's a little bit of a womp, womp, womp moment. So, but um on the flip side, it did, um, it gave me a lot of writing time. And I know a lot of people did, um, whoops, I should turn on my phone. A lot of people did different things with that time. You know, for me, I would say the first, um, the first nine months of being shut down were, were really productive. Um, I was writing a, a ton. And yeah. part of it also was in my, my day job in advertising you know, like a lot of companies we had trimmed back and I was kind of working there every other week. So it gave me way more time than I'd ever had. And that went on only for about two months, but it was enough time to sort of take the odd weeks and just be writing a, a ton and get this book finished and have that extra time to kind of run through from page one. And then also to start working on a completely new project, you know, as well. All right. So we're here to talk about your newest novel, A Good Kill, which, uh, readers out there should know has received a starred review from Publishers Weekly. Congratulations. Um, before we talk about the book, uh, would you like to read a little bit uh, to give? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Sense? Yeah, let me uh, let me uh, read a little excerpt. And what I'll do is our first setup kind of the situation. So this is this is the, the culmination of kind of three books. So the first book was The Good Detective. Uh, second book was The Evil Men Do. Um, and then now it's it's a good kill. So you can see we're doing this sort of good and evil alternating um, thing. And um, but um, the main character's name is P.T. Marsh, and he and his partner Remy. The book is set in northern Georgia. They are detectives there. Um, you know, so that's that's sort of the main characters in the setting. And the uh, the the excerpt I'm going to read um, it's about two pages I've trimmed it down to that um, but PT has arrived on the scene of an active shooter scenario at a middle school and there's reports that there's three girls held in an art class and one of them is the daughter of the chief of the police and he sort of climbed onto the roof of an outbuilding and that's where we pick this up all right so I will read from that right now I found the small maintenance shed and moved around the backside scrambled up onto an air conditioning unit. From atop the AC, I pulled myself onto the roof and scooched my six-foot-one-inch frame to the edge, my stomach flat against the surface. 
Trees from the forest hung overhead, and branches caught my tufty brown hair and scraped along my back. At a hundred feet, I could see an eight by ten window that looked out from the art room onto the back lawn of the school. I put Remy's binoculars to my face, and the art space came in clear. The room was large, with students' paintings covering every wall. Four black industrial work tables were spread throughout, high tops with stools around them, but no one sat at the stools. I scanned left and counted one, two, three students, all girls. 12 or 13, in white blouses and plaid skirts. They huddled in one corner, at the front of the group, my boss's daughter. To her right was a brunette in her 30s, the art teacher. The shooter himself was white and stood near the teacher, close to the window. Six foot tall, in mid-30s, Jed Harrington had a face the shape of an egg and sunburned skin. He was handsome in a rugged way and wore a green checkered flannel, faded jeans, and hiking boots. He looked more like a dad, bringing his kid's forgotten permission slip to school. My cell buzzed and I slid it close to my ear. I was lying prone on my stomach with a shotgun laid out in front of me. I held the binoculars with my free hand. You're not going to believe what I can see from here, I said to Remy. No sound came back at first, so I pulled the phone up and glanced at the screen. The number was blocked. Good afternoon, Detective Marsh, a man's voice came back, a voice I knew. The man on the other end was the highest ranking public official in the state of Georgia, a man named Toby Monroe, Governor Monroe, to folks who punched his name at the ballot box. I assume you're at the scene, Monroe said, the one I'm watching on TV. I am. Thank God, Monroe said, someone I can trust. But the governor and I didn't have what I'd call a trusting relationship. Ours is one in which favors are traded, and I was in arrears, owing him a big one. What is it you need, I asked. I'm calling to expedite anything you need, he said, to make sure no children are hurt at that school. My eyes tracked the gunman, pacing near the window. I hadn't seen his weapon yet, but the man's left hand was below the sill. Was he a lefty? Had he put the weapon down? I used my binoculars to scan the building at the far end of the school grounds, the structure that had just finished construction. A vinyl banner was strung across the front of the library, and my eyes stopped on something etched into the stone above the banner. Your name, I said. It's on the building. That's not why I'm calling, Monroe said. But it couldn't be good. The Monroe family name on a building after this, whatever this was about to become? Marshy said, you remember you owe me one, right? So I condensed about three pages into two there for the purpose of not going on too long, but that's, you know, sort of the fun of the, of the setup here uh, that starts this engine going, which I think goes really fast throughout the first, you know, so many pages so fast. I kind of build, had to build in a, a little bit of a rest for the reader at some point. Well, it really is. Uh, the pacing of this book is just uh, nonstop. It's just beautifully done. You know, as long as you've opened uh, with uh, with the, the, essentially the that interesting and rather risky opening scene, I, I'd like to ask you about that. You've chosen to begin your story with a school shooting, which you know, in the in the current environment today, I think c- could be a very risky proposition. Why did you choose to do that? And and were you thinking that it was in fact going to be risky? Um, I wasn't thinking, well, it's, it's not, um, it's not done politically and it's not done divisively. Um, and unfortunately it is something that, uh, is all too familiar these days. So, um, with, with that in, with that in mind, really what I was doing, I think my inspiration was not as much, um, that scenario as, um, over the three books, PT is sort of going on this journey. And in, in some cases, he's, he's sort of in a different emotional state every book, right? So he, in the first book, he's someone who thinks, I don't have anything to lose. And he finds out he's wrong and he has a lot to lose. And the second one, he starts very fragile. And it's almost like everyone stop moving and I'll heal myself. But you can't will people to stop moving. They just move and they move despite you. And so I think in the third one, what was interesting to me was... Um, he's ready to sort of come clean and he's ready to be more honest. And he becomes like, he becomes so much a a better person and a better partner. And so he's, he's at this point where he's trying to make things right. And lo and behold, someone's going to ask his past is going to sneak up. He's going to be put in a situation where he has to return a favor to, to someone that he does not want to do. So to me, that was the interesting thing is finding someone who's, who's cognizant that they're, they're kind of on this, this uh, this arc of becoming better and trying to improve themselves, yet something from their past is going to 
mess with that process. You know, I had no problem with you opening the, uh, uh, the story with a, a school shooting because it's a different kind of school shooting. And as you say, the focus is not political. It's not, um, it is intrinsic to what occurs in the whole rest of the story in just in a really amazing way. I'm going to get back to the plot in just a minute, but I want to, I want to talk a little bit about setting because you do that extremely well. Um, now, you were born in the Bronx. You moved to the Catskills, then to L.A., then to Arizona for the writing program there. Um, why did you set your work in Georgia? Um, how did you get to know the place so well, so well that anyone who didn't know you would think that you were born and raised in Georgia, which is exactly the situation I was in when I first interviewed you. Tell me about the Georgia connection. Yeah, so I, um, it's it's interesting. I have lived in all those places you mentioned, and maybe a couple more that you haven't mentioned. So the funny thing is, you know, when you live in a lot of different places, you know, I think it gives you more of a freedom to not call any place home, and you know, more of a more of a license to, um, you know, to feel comfortable owning some other place. Um, but for me, I was traveling. So I found myself traveling for advertising for my day job to Georgia over a period of years. And a lot of times we'd have a, a shoot on a Tuesday and we'd be prepping on a Thursday and there'd be some down days in between. And just over a series of years, just instead of like flying home and being home for two days and flying right back, I started just traveling up in the north and just kind of fell in love with the area. And then when I was writing The Good Detective, it was it's one of those things where I had this subplot that led back to the time of the Civil War, and it was like, okay, well, it's going to be set in the South. Where's an area that I'm getting to know, or I, I know? But it it has been it has been uh, it it has been strange. There's a there are there are Georgia writers who are really have a great reputation within Georgia who reached out to me and said, like, where do you live? Like, you're it's another Georgia boy, and um, I've had to like right away raise my hand and say, well, I'm sort of a voluntary. <laughs> you know, Georgia boy, um, to not mislead anyone. But, um, but, you know, it's, it's, I would spend a lot of time up north, um, you know, for years. And then even my son and I went on a road trip, maybe two years ago, we went from like, the Alabama border all the way up to Amicalola Falls, and then down to Savannah. And then I went back to Savannah a year later. So I really like that area of the country. You know, it's always nice to hear from people who know the territory, um, who, whom you fooled. <laughs> <laughs> well done, well done, because you certainly had me fooled. Uh, let's talk a little bit about characters now. Uh, I can tell, you know, in, in my Cork O'Connor series, for those of you out there who don't know what I do, I write the New York Times best-selling Cork O'Connor mystery series, which is set up in the great north woods of Minnesota here. Um, my protagonist in that series, Cork O'Connor, is a man of mixed heritage. He's part Irish American and he's part Ojibwe. And I can tell you exactly where the seed from my own protagonist, Cork O'Connor, came from. And here it is. Long before I was going to begin to write the series, I or or knew what it was that I wanted to write, I had in mind a guy I wanted to write about. And all I knew about him in the beginning was this. He was going to be the kind of guy who was so resilient that no matter how far you pushed him down, he would always bob back to the surface. And his name was going to be Cork. That was really the, the beginning of the whole thinking process that led to the, the evolution of my Cork O'Connor uh, character. So. Where did the seed for P.T. Marsh come from? Uh, do you remember that? You know, I had actually written something earlier with him as a as a as a character. You know, one of those books that you write and then throw away, and then oh yeah, we all have those. You want to, you know, and and I, I talked to a friend of mine recently, and I was like, no, she was like, oh, you should take it back out of the drawer, and I was like, no, no. You put it in the file cabinet, you put it in the back of your truck, you drive to the dump, you dump to the dump, you burn down the dump, you make sure it doesn't come back. So I did write something with uh, with a character named P.T. Marsh. And there were certain, what's, what's interesting is what remained of that is sort of a sense of humor, which you might think is surprising because the book, he, he does have a sense of humor and him and Remy both have that. It's, it's, these are moody books, but there is some humor that runs through it. So that was... That was what survived of it, but um, I think you know in the in the beginning, um, I don't even know where he came from other than that, you know. But I, but I really like the idea of of the two of them together, and I liked where they might go. And these are characters that are on completely different 
trajectories right now. And I think um, I think as I finished um, the second book, The Evil Men Do, I um, I sort of liked Remy better than PT. <laughs> You know, like it's it's interesting. I was like, I was. She's she sort a pretty of has, snappy character. Yeah. Yeah. So she sort of had the moral authority at the end of the book, and um, she was sort of staring at all the men, saying like, "For real?" Like, you know. Um, so th that's you know that's I really liked where she was moving as a character, and some of that is PT does things he shouldn't do, and sometimes you you forgive that in your characters and sometimes you allow them to go off the reservation a little. Um, so um, it was interesting in this book to, to find her going back the other way as, as PT tries to, um, he defers more and he's a better teammate and um, he's learning how to be uh, politically smart and she's becoming more of a gray person who sees the gray and not so much the black and white and it's just kind of mirrors, I think, how, how people are in real life, that you get a little bit of wisdom and acceptance and you understand compromise better and you go through stages where that growth happens and it stops. And it's the same way in real life. People are either in a state of growth or decay and it feels like we're never just coasting. Um, re remind me, have you ever told readers what PT stands for? Yeah, I don't I, know that I, I do. Yeah, so it's Paul Thomas Marsh. So, okay. um, and I, I don't know that it's funny you said that. I don't know what is in this. You know where it is in this. In a good kill, it exists in one location where you know, there's a series of antagonists in this, and they're really three book antagonists. You know, in in the vein of like small fish, medium sized fish, other medium sized fish, really big fish. Um, in that in that vein, there's so I think there's one moment where he uh, there's a, there's a there's a there's a gentleman who's in the all the books. Uh, he has a very small appearance in The Good Detective and then a, a bigger one in The Evil Men Do. And he um, he eventually ends up being stationed within the police department. And when he and PT finally face off, he says, Paul Thomas Marsh, you know, okay. and I think that's the only place that's in book three, but it's in book one a little more. You know, as long as you've mentioned, we talked about uh, Remy uh, Morgan. Let's talk a little bit more about, you know, no protagonist exists in a vacuum. And often um, much of the charm of a story, particularly a series, comes from the adjunct characters that you surround your protagonist with. And you've got some really uh, interesting, compelling characters. Um, Remy Morgan, um, let's see, Marvin, who yeah. I just loved. Oh, and of course, Purvis. So could you talk to readers a little bit about some of the adjunct characters in, in the series? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, starting backwards, so Purvis is his dog. So he has a bulldog, which in the books is seven years old, eight years old, nine years old. John, um, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Is Purvis modeled after one of your rescue dogs? No, although the new there is a character named Bo, the dog named Bo, which is uh, modeled after okay. uh, after my dog. Yes, for and, those of you out there who don't know John, he has rescue dogs. Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so, um, Purvis is Purvis is PT's um, bulldog, and what's interesting, you know, I'm writing the first book, and there's a moment early on in a rewrite where PT is parked somewhere, and he's about to do something really stupid. And from the back of the truck, you, the reader, hears this voice. So we're doing this, and I'm, and I, and I just wrote it that way. And I sort of stopped and said, "Well, you can't have a talking dog. This isn't a Disney movie, you know." Um, and when you hear it out loud, you're like, "Well, that's not going to work." But within the context, Purvis is sort of like his conscience, and so his Purvis sort of functions as that role throughout the books. You're always waiting for Purvis to sort of weigh in and maybe he's waiting for Purvis to weigh in sometimes too. So um, so that's sort of the fun of, of Purvis. And sometimes it's real Purvis and sometimes it's imaginary. Like he, he will hear the voice and he'll say Purvis, but not real Purvis, Purvis in my head. As, as, <laughs> as a bizarre distinction from when the dog is really there, he does speak yeah. in some way. So, um, for this, the the deal with Purvis, um, Marvin is so Marvin w was is PT's father-in-law from you know his wife who's passed, 
And, um, you know, Marvin is someone that throughout the books, PT feels like, I think they each feel like they have to take care of. And then if they yeah. tell the other person the truth, the other person can't really handle it. And that's sort of the mutual relationship between um, them. And I think, um, I think, I think Marvin starts to have a bead on PT in book two, but they don't know how to read each other all the time. And they go in and out of each other's lives. And I think in, in the third book, Marvin is, is, is really a key character to sort of tell PT like, you need to change your life. Like you, you need to start focusing on these things and you need to get over some of the things in the past. And that's a lot of what's going on in the, in the, in kind of the B or C story with PT in his own life is, is like, how does he move forward? from what used what what happened to him you know yes. and i think marvin is someone who i think pt thinks i can't move forward cuz marvin wouldn't appreciate that because because of his daughter and marvin does not feel that way marvin feels the opposite way um so i think that's kind of the fun of of marvin and purvis i wonder i, I, I try to remember if you said you you talked about remy too um but we've talked a little bit about her but let's let's talk a little bit more about Remy because she's really an interesting complex character. Yeah, and I, I think I, when I was first starting to write this book, I thought this is like this is someone who I haven't seen enough of in books. Yeah. She's she was um, uh, PT's partner uh, earlier, and even though they're not partnered up in this, there's still that relationship. Right, so so there's a there's some falling out that happens, and then some coming back together that happens throughout the series. I don't want to give up too much, yeah. but um, you know, and some of it has to do with honesty, you know. Um, but uh, you know, it, what I was saying was, it, it's a character that I think you're seeing more of in in crime fiction now, but I hadn't seen enough of kind of growing up and and reading it. She's strong. Yeah. She's female. She's black. She's very uh, uh, physical. She's a crack shot. She's working in a man's world. Like I said before, she kind of has some moral authority in some places in in the book. You know, looking at the way PT acts and the chief acts and saying like, I don't know if I want to be part of 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 you, uh, whether you want to you want me to be part of it or not. And I think the cool thing is is to see her sort of become. Uh, a little more accepting. And I think PT realizes he makes a comment that he was always trying to get her to see the gray. And now she's so drenched in gray, it sort of shocks him because he's kind of going the other way. Um, so I, I had a lot of fun kind of working on the two of them. And regardless of where they are, they still have their relationship. They're, it's a very like close, intimate relationship between the two of them being on the same page and I think she starts to make some small mistakes herself that she never made in the first two books. Yeah, and you know, in the course of across the course of the story, as they are doing their in and out in their relationship, I just found myself uh, hoping, okay, you can do this. You can, yeah, you can come together. You can understand. Yeah, yeah. great. Yeah, you 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 give us characters that it, we can invest in emotionally very easily. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about plotting because. Um, this is some of the tightest, most surprising, most complex plotting that I've seen in the genre in a very long time. Does this come naturally to you or how did you acquire this skill? Well, I think, so I think like for me, book two was really hard. Um, and I don't know if you can remember because uh, you've got like 20 books, Ken. So I don't know if you can remember like... Uh, what you know when you're writing your first book you're kind of on your own time you're on your own but all time the time in the world yeah exactly nobody knows you exist and then you come to this next one and it's like okay we need a book in a year and i yeah. wasted about two three months trying to resurrect an old book that should have been sent to the dump and wasn't um so then i had about nine ten months and i think like it was like a baptism by fire in a lot of ways and for me I had to, I remember talking to a writer friend of mine who has several books out and I said, yeah, I learned how to write a book while writing book two. And he was like, well, how is that possible when book one was like really celebrated and everything? I was like, yeah, but in this one, I had to learn about discipline and plot and how to replot. And so I learned a lot of that. And, you know, one of the things 
I look back on or I try to figure out now is like, what's the best place to start the story from? Like, when is the when should the when's the latest possible moment to start it? Um, so I think I think there was a huge education for me writing the second book. So when I went into the third one, I was like, okay, now I need to now I'm in a much better shape to plot sort of like some of the masters that I see. Like that's what I want to do is like build something really intricate and something that feels like I read so many books that I think this is such a great magic trick, you know, where I'm on a certain ride and I have no idea that I've missed certain signs along the way. And if I went back and read it a second time, maybe I see the signs just a little bit, but I still don't see them. And um, so that was for me, um, kind of building the arcs of the characters and building three stories and doing that it definitely, it took a lot of work, but it, it did feel more natural this time, you know, than, than ever before. I, I think I read in an interview that your first novel, uh, The Good Detective, you didn't, you didn't use an outline, you were just kind of discovering as you went along, but that with uh, with uh, The Evil Men Do and with A uh, Good Kill, you did more, followed more of an outline. Is that, am I, am I correct in my recollection? No, you're, you're correct. And this time um, I actually built sort of a plot wall in my writing space and would actually put up all the scenes and then replot and replot and move things around constantly because I was really trying to, I was trying to learn pace and like how, how someone like devours the pages and then what's too fast and what's too slow and, and how to tell, how to tell more stories, but in a way that um, is, is, is more natural and, I don't know. I, I don't know how I'm, whether I'm explaining it right. Yeah, actually, I, I, I get you. You've got a lot of different storylines, and how do you weave those seamlessly so yeah. that they all flow into, in the end, they all flow in together? Which, you know, because at the end of this book, I'm going, oh my God, I have no idea how we got here, but here we are. This is just amazing. Yeah, and some of those things, like you just discover along the way. You know, yeah. like you're, you're writing something and maybe your brain figured something out and placed a clue for you. And does that happen to you? Um, you know, I've been a storyteller for so long now. I've got so many books under my belt <laughs> that, uh, you know, I, in the early days I did outline. Uh, and then um, I got to the point where I, I was able to keep a story pretty much in my, I think my story's through before I ever put my fingers to the keyboard as completely as I can. But I don't have to outline. I don't use the the story wall or whatever you call it yeah. anymore. Um, I kind of play with it in my head. But by the time I really put my fingers to the keyboard, I know how this story is going to play out, which helps me a lot. Yeah. Um, I, I read in an interview that from the beginning, you saw uh, the P.T. Marsh story as a kind of a three or a four book story arc. Um, now, in this events from in, in this book, events from P.T.'s past play a significant role in the eventual uh, denouement of the story. Did did you see that ending coming all along, uh, even while you were at work on The Good Detective? Did you have a sense of where this was going to end up? I had a sense of what I wanted to resolve by the third book. Um, not all the details. Definitely, you know, like you just said, that the once I've plotted out, once I kind of know where I'm going in book three on its own, I kind of have a really good idea of that. I, I always leave a little bit of space because things change and I, you know, my editor will come in with a surprising, like, well, what if we did this or say, I don't really feel like this is, this is, you know, could be stronger. And then I'll say, okay, just give me some time and I'll think of a different approach there. So um, I definitely thought, okay, this could be three books, this could be, could be four books. I didn't want it to be one of those things where someone says, oh man, you know, I got to the third book and he still didn't answer these questions where it <laughs> felt like it went on too long. Um, but I didn't want to rush it because I've experienced both of those in either books or TV series, you know, where it feels like it got rushed and it ends too soon or it feels like someone's really milking it. Um, so I really felt like I want to answer these on a time like on a really good arc that feels natural for him. Yeah, it, it you tied up the all of the threads very neatly, uh, very emotionally satisfying, logically satisfying. Well done, well done. Yeah, I mean, I think there's more PT and Remy stories that could be told. I definitely think, uh, but I I felt like, you know, he has to he has to he has to be able as a character to be able to move forward. And um, the best way for him to move forward is to be able to address 
some of the things that happened to him in his life. It, you know, I think there's a moment near the end where they actually talk about that and say all the bad men are gone and they realize there's new bad men all the time, you know. I want to revisit this in just a minute because I have another question that's going to feed into that. Uh, but before I, I do that, uh, here's another one for you. Uh, another interview I read um, uh, talked about the influence of other writers on you, James Lee Burke and the beauty of his language, Michael Connolly and his plotting, McCormick McCarthy and James Elroy and their sense of dialogue. Now, these were early influences as you began to find your way as a writer, your own voice, uh, your own uh, uh, path. Um, do these writers still have a great influence on you or have you become comfortable enough with your own voice and your own process and the way you go about creating a story that you don't really worry about that anymore? Yeah, I think for this book, I mean, I used to, so I would do a lot of my uh, writing in the library. Um, it was a place. <laughs> Wait I a minute, Stephen King says you're not supposed to do that, right? <laughs> I know, right? I've actually, that broke my heart when I read that in uh, on writing. What does Stephen King know? <laughs> I remember reading that and it broke my heart. Um, so, um, but I used to do a lot of, a lot of writing there. Um, I would also write in, I would write at night after work in restaurants and they just let me sit there for like two, three hours, really nice people. Um, and, but when I'm in the library, I would walk over and pick up books. And it, it was one of those things where it's a little bit of a primer and it gets you going and you hear someone's voice. And I would, I would probably, I would sit in that section, like by that author, you know, I'm like trying to channel that. Um, two things happen. One, there's no libraries open, <laughs> you know, um, there's no libraries open anymore. So that just shut down. You know, restaurants were open in California. So, um, so I couldn't do either of those things anymore. But I think like, yeah, you start, I started to get like partway through book two. I kind of don't need that as a primer in my head. Um, yeah. I still, I still like those authors. I read the, the Jealous Kind by James Lee Burke in the last year, which I, it came out a couple of years ago, but I hadn't read it. And I was just blown away um, by just the descriptions. It's it's one of those books you read and you think this can't have not happened. It's just so realistic that it can't have not happened. It can't be fiction. And his prose, his prose is some of the most beautiful you're going to read, regardless of genre. Yeah, yeah. So so I think um, I, I think uh, I, I still I still love all those authors. Um, and but uh, yeah, you start to develop your own voice, and I think you also develop the pace at which you structure sentences and, you know, that sort of thing. And it becomes sort of your style. And like now I'm writing a completely different thing, but it, there's a lot of that, that st structural pace moves with me to a new world. Yeah. Before I started Ordinary Grace, you know, I've been writing the Cork O'Connor series and I wanted a different voice. I wanted, I, I wanted a different prose. Um, so I read Cormac McCarthy and, you know, I have to admit, when I'm reading a Cormac McCarthy, I often have no idea what the hell is going on. But he's just so beautiful in the way that he writes his, his words, structures his uh, his uh, paragraphs and his sentences. The cadence is beautiful. So, yeah, yeah I think we still need uh, periodically. Still need, need yeah, you, need, you need commas. We still, the world <laughs> still needs commas. <laughs> well, if you've read Ordinary Grace, you see that I said the hell with commas in that book. <laughs> so you, do, do you still work a day job? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was working today. <laughs> okay, so you still structure your writing around your work hours. Yeah, I mean, now it's so different in the pandemic because the future of work is changing and so many people are just being given the option, do you want to work from home? And so many people are saying, yes, I want to work from home. It's it's kind of shocking. Um, so my writing space, which used to be this closed off space that I would go to is now my my workspace, we, our office is now opening back up for everyone in July 1st who wants to come back. But from what we understand, only a fraction of the people are going to come back to it. But yeah, I took a couple half days this week for the book release, but I'm still working as busy as ever. Well, my hat's off to you to uh, to accomplish a book a year and continue to you know, work a full-time job. Uh, I don't know how you, how you do that. Uh, so here's a question for you, just kind of off topic, because it's one I think about a lot. Um, for you, what's the most dis difficult aspect of what we do? I'll tell you up front what mine is. For me, it's the marketing and, and, and all that requires of me. 
because uh, it takes a different kind of energy than writing the novels. You know, I'm not talking about events. I love doing events because I, I get energized by those, um, you know, book signings, all of that. But, um, but selling myself on social media, that exhausts me. I know you're, you work in the ad business, you work in, so what's, what's tough for you? That's tough for me too. Oh, um, good. I'm glad to hear you that. You know, um, yeah. I, and, and I, um, I, I mean, I came up doing a lot of print work and have done TV work and I necessarily now everything you do affects digital and social media. It's just where, where the dollars are going and where the attention is going. But it doesn't mean that I can can do what I do for clients for myself. Uh, I mean, I was posting, I was posting on social media for this book every single day, and every time I post, I was like this. I was like, I didn't. I, I was, I was like, not like I'm going to do something wrong. I just like the idea of self publicity for so many writers is just so hard. I mean, I don't, you know, and, and advertising is hard. I don't have any trouble pitching any product for, a, for a, a client, but the idea of trying to, to get someone to read a book of mine, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's so hard. And it's, it's especially bad, bad because discovery, I mean, you know, I did some interview this week and they were asking like, were you nervous about the release? And, and I, I said, no, I'm not nervous about the release. I, I'm nervous about the discovery. We're in the age where discovery is going down. There's not that many bookstores for people to browse in. I mean, even pre-pandemic. No. Um, but there, the the idea of like, how does someone find my work in the first place? So I have massive anxiety over that. And if I'm in charge of that, uh, my, that anxiety just just doubles. <laughs> and I think I think a lot of writers feel that way. I think a lot of writers feel like, oh man, I'm not as good as Kent is. Kent must have this down. Like, I think everyone thinks somebody else knows something and- Oh God, yes. <laughs> but that's, uh, that's, the, the, that's one end of the spectrum for me. I would say probably my favorite part is revising. Nobody says that usually, but I love revising. I love editing. Eh. <laughs> I hate revising. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I feel like my best work is done in revising, but I think some of that some of that may come out of like being someone who for the day job had to just rewrite and rewrite and rewrite because that is the one thing I, that carries over for me from from writing in you know advertising or business or whatever area I've written in is is um is you don't kind of own anything your client owns it your coworker owns it um, so you feel very comfortable just rewriting it and changing it and changing it again. And then the client will weigh in and they'll say, well, it really wasn't what we're looking for. And you say, okay, no problem. We can change it. You know, so you, you get that ability to rewrite, rewrite, and you get the ability to see something completely differently. And um, I think it's a good trait that a lot of people don't allow with their own writing. So for me, I'm like, okay, let's just rethink this entire scene. And you know, when I, when I have a scene that's failing, I'll actually pick up my other laptop, like, I have two laptops I work off of and I'll just pick the other laptop because it doesn't have the scene in it. And I'll say, yeah. okay, I'm just gonna write it on this other laptop, open Microsoft Word, a blank document and write the scene right now as I wanna write it. And nine times out of 10, it's better than the first scene. There are enough elements, what remains is the spine of the idea of the scene. And then I just rewrite it better. And then I look at the two of them, I'm like, oh, between the two of these, I've had it fixed. So um, I, I, I really enjoy the revising. I know no one else does, but it's something. Well, there are those who do, and then there are those of us who do not. Uh, we're going to go to questions here in just a minute because I think we have some from uh, folks who are, who are watching. But I have one final question for you. Uh, in an interview that was just published, I think, online yesterday, I read that you're at work on a novel that won't take place in Georgia and won't include PT as a character. Um, are you at liberty to talk at all about this project? Are you comfortable at all telling us anything about uh, this? It's uh, it's a high concept, um, it's a high concept uh, ensemble piece. That's all I can kind of say until I have okay. a until I have like some sort of deal on it. But um, I'm really excited about it. I've been working on it for about ten months. I'm taking more time than I normally have. Um, part of that is just to kind of slow write it at a different pace than I than I uh, have needed to before. And then part of it is just my life in the last year. My son is going off to college. 
Um, so we're coming out of the whole pandemic. You know, my kids were both home at school. So um, my life just changed so drastically. My writing went down a little. And at some level, it was nice to write something a little slower. And now it's kind of picking up. So I, I'm excited. I've I've got a couple, you know, you get your family reads, like your wife reads it, your son reads it. I don't know if those count really. Um, <laughs> but but I do what are they gonna say to you other than nice job, dear, or I like the other book better, or you know, <laughs> they, shouldn't, exactly. they shouldn't be our all right, they shouldn't be our editors. Totally. Well, I so I sent to my agent and my agent set, sent me an email that said, This is the best partial I've read in 10 years. And I was like, okay, I'm on to something. So it needed, a, that was like six months ago, seven months ago. So it still needs a lot of work. I've gone back to page one to start it back over completely um, with the goal of getting it done by the end of the year. But I'm really excited. I, I, you know, when you get really excited, you don't want to talk about something? As, go, as, go so you're talk talking vagaries? That's I'm the same way. I don't want to just, you know, I don't know what to disperse the energy uh, of the project. But then a follow-up question is, do you see at some point coming back and uh, revisiting PT? I would love to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I think this has given me, uh, this has given me a, a leap forward. I think whenever I finished a book, when I start the next book, I'm, I'm a better writer than I was, you know, when I started the one before. So, um, I'm really curious what I'll bring back to sort of the PT Marsh series when I come back to it, but I definitely want to keep writing it. You know, I took a year away from my Cork O'Connor series after the third book because I was kind of corked out. And uh, and the book I wrote when I came back won the Anthony for best novel of the year. So you know, come back with a fresh energy, and I think it makes it. I think it does think it makes. I do think it makes a huge difference. Uh, so um, McKenna, if you're still with us, I think uh, you indicated uh, that we had some questions from the audience. We do have questions from the audience, um, but first I would like to do what I do for any of our guest interviewers, which is to just give you a chance to talk very quickly about what you have coming up in um, August, Kent. Okay, I have number 18 in my Corco Connor series coming up. It's a book called Lightning Strike, and it's a bit different from anything I've written in the series before. It's a prequel. Uh, for those of you who, uh, who are familiar with my series, you know that Corco Connor was sheriff of Tamarack County at one point, and when he was a kid, his father was also sheriff of Tamarack County, and Cork's father was killed in the line of duty when Cork was an adolescent. Lightning Strike picks up Cork in the summer before his father is killed. And what it allows me to do is explore that important relationship, father and son, that's so uh, significant in shaping Cork into the man who occupies center stage in the series. There are some really, there's some really great mysteries at the heart of it, but really it's an opportunity to get to know Cork O'Connor and his background, where he came from, and why he is the way he is uh, in, in the series. Well, I can't wait. And also, like I said, I can't wait to see you in person because that's going to be very special. Um, one of our very first events with um, an author oh. live in store again. So I'm so looking forward to my visit, McKenna. Yeah, I, love, it's gonna be I love visiting Murder by the Book. Well, thank you. We love hosting you. And hopefully we'll have John for, um, for the next one. Um, okay, we do have some questions. So this one is um, for John. What are the challenges of writing in first person? Well, I would say uh, the number one challenge is you have to stay with that person. So the advantage is you get sort of the immediacy and you get the intimacy, but the disadvantage is they can be lying sometimes. And sometimes they're lying on purpose or sometimes they're lying to themselves. So, um, and I've, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm uh, I, I've only written in first person in these three books and the next book I'm writing is in first person as well. So um, I can't speak more to the challenges. I, I, I said to a friend of mine, a writer friend recently, I'm like, oh, I'm not a good enough writer to write in third person. And he was like, that's hilarious. He's like, I'm not sure if I'm a good enough writer to write in first person. And because we both have done the opposite, um, you know, so we're both just fearing what we haven't done. But uh, to me, those are the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, Ken, did you have anything to add to that? Well, I've written uh, both first person and third person narratives, you know, third person, uh, whatever, all the variations of third person. Uh, you know, I have to be honest, I prefer first person because it's such an intimate way to tell a story. 
Um, you're absolutely right, John. The drawback is you have to be able to get the information that's necessary, and your narrator is fairly limited sometimes in what he or she knows. So I've had to be really creative in how to get important information into the reader in a way that sounds believable. Yeah. Um, okay, so this one again is very specific to John. Would Remy have her own story? Yeah, it was a conversation that came up very briefly at the end of the Evil Men Do with the publisher. Um, I think um, I'd be very curious to that. I also don't know that I, I don't know that I know enough. Like I already, you know, I'm already putting myself in the mind of PT, a North Georgia detective, to put my mind into uh, the space of Remy. I don't know if I have enough knowledge and ability to, to tell from that point of view, to be honest. I think it came up because she plays such a strong role in book two that um, the question was posed to me, like, would you ever consider writing a Remy book? And I don't know, maybe maybe in the future sometime when I'm, you know, uh, stronger, I would consider it. Fair enough. Um, we have another question. Uh, I'm not going to put it on the screen because it's long, but essentially, did you know how um, Marsh's narrative would play out in this book when you wrote the first book? Yeah, that was similar to something Ken was uh, Kent was asking a minute ago. I I, um, I had a good idea of some of the background of what happened to him. You know, like you have to be sort of the the evil uh, the evil god of your universe. You know, the 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 genius that knows, like that looks down and sees everything. So I definitely had an idea of kind of what happened to him and who some of the players were involved. But then there were some surprises that I did not know and some that came in literally on the last draft in the last month, um, which is always interesting. It makes you wonder whether your mind knew them the whole time and it just didn't tell you or, or what, but there were definitely, I mean, I think this is one of the, a good tale is one of those books that there's a surprise 20 pages out and there's a surprise 10 pages out and two pages out from the end. You're still sort of putting little pieces together as he puts them together. And, um, you know, he gets to act on all those and try to get justice in, in a lot of different ways. And sometimes he gets physical justice, but I think he has to learn whether the type of justice he's getting in the first book and the second book is right. And that's a big question for him. Like, how does he, how does he meet out that justice? Like, is it all physical, muscular, or does he have to outthink people? Because there's people definitely outthinking him. And he's definitely out muscling people in the first couple books. And he has to get to the point where he can outthink people. So some of those were sub character surprises that came to me as I wrote book two. The tough thing about looking at it like three books is it's a process of stopping, which is weird and unnatural for a writer to go, okay, um, if it's three books, what's the middle like? Like where does book two end so that it's fulfilling, but it's not too fulfilling because there's a number of things that still have to happen in book three. Kent, have you um, have you um, thought about any changes that Cork has gone through over the course of these books that were surprises to you? Yeah, a lot of the things that Cork is afraid of. <laughs> He's a pretty manly kind of a guy, and every time I discover something that uh, that he really fears, I'm thinking, well, I I just I know you better now, and and maybe we know people best by because of the things that they're afraid of, maybe afraid of revealing about themselves. Um, yeah, one of the things I love about writing the Cork O'Connor series, because for those readers out there who don't know my series, the 17 current books span 15 years in the lives of the characters. So every time I sit down to write, they've aged, they're different people. And so every time I, uh, I'm writing about, you know, different folks, uh, and I love that. I love that I, I have discovered new things that I can share with the reader or that I'm discovering as I'm on the journey with Cork and Clan. Did you have fun writing this prequel, kind of knowing what you know about him now, but visiting him back before he is what he is? I had a hoot writing this story. <laughs> Do you know, um, my last two standalones, Ordinary Grace and This Tender Land, we're both about 12, 13 year old kids. And here I am with Cork at 12, 13 years old. And, and it just felt so comfortable for me uh, writing, writing an adolescent boy. And I, 
I'm fond of saying I think that comes to me so easily because, in my opinion, men never mature much past 12 or 13 years of age. Fair enough. Um, so we actually have a question related to that that just came up. Um, any thoughts on writing another standalone in the next few years, Kent? Yeah, actually, um, so Lightning Strike, number 18 in the series, is coming out in August. I have finished the first draft of number 19 in the series that will be out in the fall of 2022. It's a book called Jawbone Creek. And I have just begun sketches for the next standalone, which will be a companion novel to both Ordinary Grace and This Tender Land. Phew, I bet your editor's happy. Look at you, all of that turned in with plenty of time. <laughs> you know, which is a rarity um, for me, let me tell you. I, I always <laughs> been talk trying to meet deadlines. That's funny. Okay, I have a question for both of you. Um, what books did you read in your formative years? And was there a book that made you want to be a writer? And let's start with you, John. Wow. There was a book I read uh, called um, Been Down So Long Looks Like Up to Me. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it, um, but I've, you know, that had a certain music to it and a certain sort of recklessness to it that I thought, this is really a lot of fun. Like a character can be reckless and and fun and meandering, and it's a coming of age, college age thing. And um, you know, and I've looked back at it and gone, why did I love this book so much? A little bit, but it, it you know, and I looked for other books that you know, it's a weird story. The the writer, it was a debut, and he was on the way to his book launch party and was thrown from the back of a motorcycle or a car or something. And that was, oh, that was the only book he ever wrote. So, um, you know, that's why you've never, I think his name is Richard Freena. A lot of people have never heard of him, but he wrote this really kind of swerving, you know, book and I read it, you know, so that plus I would say, um, you know, uh, my dad, you know, really early on gave me all the JD Salinger books he had and he had like many copies of them and I've read, you know, uh, those, there aren't many of them, you know, but I've read them and I've probably read them 20 times as a kid, yeah. you know. Nice. How about you, Ken? Good choice for rereads, John. So here's a story. When I was uh, 12 years old, this was the summer between my uh, sixth and seventh grade year, I was a Boy Scout and that was the summer I decided I was going to get my reading merit badge. One of the requirements for the reading merit badge, at least back then, was you had to spend some time volunteering in your local library. So I was living in a small town in Ohio, went to the library and made the arrangements. And when the time came, I showed up to do my duty. Now, this was long before they had uh, computerized check-in and check-out. I don't know if you're old enough to remember those little pocket things that were glued on in the back cover of every book, you know, with the slip inside. So what they did was they put me to work date stamping the returned, uh, the returned books. They gave me this little black ink pad and a changeable rubber date stamp. And so for the first hours there it was sort of ka-chunk, 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 ka-chunk. And after an hour that the librarian walked my way and asked me this very librarian-esque question. She said, Kent, what do you like to read? Well, the honest God, truth was I like to read comic books, but I didn't want to tell her that. So uh, so I briefly considered lying to her, but there was that whole, a scout is trustworthy thing going on. So I told her the truth and without batting an eye, she said to me, have you ever read The Count of Monte Cristo? I walked out of the library, McKenna, with that book under my arm. I came back um, uh, a couple of weeks later and checked out The Three Musketeers. And after that, it was The Man in the Iron Mask. And that librarian eventually turned me on to H.G. Wells and Jules Verne and Arthur Conan Doyle and you know Robert Louis Stevenson. But it all began with um, uh, The Count of Monte Cristo. That's fantastic. I love asking that question because, you know, it, it's just, it always harkens back to someone's childhood and people, you know, smile big and there's warm memories and it's always a, I don't know, I always yeah. love hearing, hearing those stories. Um, we did have a, a very specific question pop up. Will, will either of you be attending VoucherCon in Minneapolis next year? Well, I'm 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 going to BoucherCon in New Orleans this year, the one that's in August. I have not. Uh, I didn't even know. You can see how, what a bad planner I am. I didn't even know that uh, BoucherCon uh, where it was after that. So, Kent. Yeah, I'm a guest of honor. I'm going to be there. <laughs> I figured as much. <laughs> yeah. I thought that might be the case also. Okay, well, we actually have covered all the things and our time is up. Um, thanks to everyone for watching. Again, congrats to you for the new book, John. Kent, can't wait to um, see you in person for um, the new Corpagon. <laughs>
<laughs> there we go. I'm going to call John Vanna going forward. Good job modeling all the books. <laughs> um, all right. That's it. Everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you again both so much. There's information and links to order books um, in the comments. And um, I wish everyone a wonderful evening. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.